Okay, I'd uh, just like to start by uh, paying homage to um, my ancestors, uh, the people who've kept this land so pristine up till recent history. Um, I'd like to thank the sun, and without which we wouldn't have the plants in which we're all convening here about. And also the cicadas. Now, many of you may have been to the Amazon and drunk ayahuasca with shaman there, and um, they have these magical rattles made from leaves, and they sound exactly like this. The cicadas to that beat. And so I think um, we're all blessed to be here in the presence of cicadas. Um, they can suck on the roots of trees for anything up to 15 years. And while they attach to that tree root like an umbilical cord, they are receiving all the cosmic light that the tree is experiencing through its leaves, both sunlight and starlight, in a form of condensed light information about what is occurring throughout the universe. That is then condensed down into the earth, and all the earth energy drawn up of all the history of this earth is taken up and mixed alchemically into a tree sap which this cicada sucks on for that amount of time and then it births. And what we're hearing as a sound vocal download is this, and this is the information about what is happening now. So, enjoy. Okay, it's a, a kind of large topic, so I'm going to go through as fast as I can. Um, I've already briefly discussed the cicada sound signature and I'll start with a vision that recurred over a number of ayahuasca sessions and it uh, was telling me about Australia, the eastern seaboard and the collapse of space-time. So it started off in London maybe 12, 15 years ago. Uh, Terence McKenna happened to come round to my place and he was talking about ayahuasca. I immediately knew that sometime in the future I would be participating. At the time I had some toads living in my house, uh, both Bufo Marinus and Bufo Alvirus. Now I'm not sure if you're aware of what the toads do, but the toads have a magical influence on reality. From living with the toads, each time I was participating in my own psychoactive experiences, when I would be at my peak, lying on the floor, the toads would appear and sing. And the sound of the toads would shatter the visions in a particular way, so that a strange light would appear. Now this strange light was not unfamiliar, this was like a clear light experience. Um, So I learned that in order for the toads to have an effect, you did not have to squeeze them and smoke them. They just had to be somewhere in the field. It was a subtle field, yet really powerful. Um, I found myself in the Amazon uh, around about 2000 in a small village called San Francisco, taking medicine with an eight-year-old shaman called Don Martin. And um, we were sitting in a malocca. There was boats going along the river about a kilometre, half a kilometre away with the outboard engines and they had a specific sound as the sound would bounce off the trees and come up to the village. And as um, the strong, the one particular night, the strong brew of ayahuasca started, it sounded like not one but many, many boats had turned and were heading towards the village, but there was no river. And as they approached and got louder, this sound increased and increased and the whole forest lit up and all became light. And this sound was actually the toads that sounded like the boats. And from the sound moving towards me, the sound then surrounded me and then became one. There was one sound, all the, 
all the insects on the forest, all the forest sound became one all enveloping sound. And I saw how all the insects and frogs and night birds were the voices of the trees as I imagine they are in the day. And so what we're hearing is the voice of plants through these creatures. So I made a recording of this on a mini disc and came back to Australia and six months later I was listening to it and as I turned it on and I heard these toad sounds I was launched into another vision and the vision showed me some native American Indian hands releasing toads into Australia. Now I know that it was more likely scientists who had released Bufo marinus um, that had come from Hawaii into Australia. But the vision was telling me that it was time for toads to arrive in Australia on the eastern seaboard and the reason was manifold. First of all, the, so the toads, Bufo marinus, that we have in this country come from the Amazon and they are linked with the ayahuasca via a sound signature. So they were bringing with them bufotenin. And bufotenin, although it's not totally psychoactive on its own, I think it is maybe at high dosages, it's more synergistic. And in Yahe, you have um, the Banisteriopsis carpi mixed with Diplopteris cabarana, both vines. And the Diplopteris cabarana has different alkaloids to Psychotria viridis. Psychotria viridis may have a large amount of DMT, but Diplopteris cabarana has DMT, 5-MeO-DMT, and bufotenin. And the bufotenin seemed to actually take the hormone of light, which is DMT, mixed with the banisteriopsis, which was the umbilical connection between heaven and earth, and ground it with the bufotenin in the body onto earth. And so I experienced that what the, the toads were coming here to do was to bring the sound signature of a new wave of consciousness for the beginning and end of time, which may be the end of the Mayan calendar. And when there was enough pure megatonnage of bufotenin bought by the toads, the acacia fields would alight, and everyone in the presence would be more easily be able to digest the pure light that is flowing from the acacia fields without having to extract them. So, big surprise for all of us, and for those of us who've um, indulged, it won't be nearly as shocking for those of us who haven't. Okay, so, while this was all happening, um, in the early 90s, there was a, a consciousness bubble, uh, the birth of silicon consciousness on the western seaboard of uh, California, which we now call Silicon Valley. This was an update um, occurring for this to happen. There, there was a, the burst of this consciousness bubble which proliferated silicon technology into our culture. And throughout Western culture now at desktop height are sitting thousands and thousands if not millions of silicon chips in the form of computer chips forming an artificial crystalline grid which is preparing for this upcoming new information download. So along with mobile phones, which all, most people are carrying, and their computers, we have, we have set up an artificial crystalline grid for this time. And silicon consciousness is teaching us through stealth a new language of light. Now this is going to reverse the Tower of Babel where communication was, no, was, was broken. We're moving into a form of telepathy via the training wheels of technology. So we are learning about a new language. When we talk about a desktop, we're talking about a desktop on our computer, but we each have an operating system, a desktop, a trash file, etc. Some, some of them need updating, some don't. <laughs> okay, so that was the language of light. Um, plants, as most of you know, are the true alchemists. Um, although they're blood differs from ours by just one molecule, them being, I think, magnesium and ours being iron. Chlorophyll has an incredible role on our planet because plants are the only beings in physical form outside of us when we learn how to do it, to be able to turn light into physical form. 
supplants of producing our food, our shelter, our medicine, our entheogenesis. And this is by virtue of bringing light to earth and making it in the physical form. Now this is the first part of the sacred cross where the energy of the light comes down, is captured by the plant and drawn down into the earth and the energy from the earth is drawn up into the plant and in this alchemical blend is produced, let's say, a fruit. Our role as humans are like trees, upside down trees that have learned how to walk with our roots in them, our, our roots are our minds in the sky. And so what we do is we eat these fruits and they are way more than actual sugars and fruits but psychoactive substance and then we spread them across the earth. So together, um, trees and us form a, a sacred cross where we spread the information and trees ground and draw the information up. All creatures, part, all creatures moving and eating plants participate in the spreading of information in this thin blue band which could effectively be like the cellular membrane around the earth. Okay, now this is called the hot expanding electric earth. Um, I've heard a lot of people talking about global warming and I want you to imagine walking um, into a room where a lady is giving birth and if you don't know anything about birth and you've never experienced birth you may think there's an emergency situation going on because there may be pain, there may be blood and it may seem like trauma but what's actually happening is a birth and this is what's happening to our earth there's a birth in consciousness about to occur we're perceiving this as global warming and trying to stop a global warming. For each degree in temperature rise, from a chemical point of view, there's 10 times speed in reaction. So as the earth heats up, everything speeds up. Now I don't need to tell everyone that, every, that their lives are speeding up. I mean, the way in which technology is unfolding, the way in which we're processing our stuff, is speeding up and it's going to continue and continue up to a certain inflection point and this will be a mass flowering of consciousness I believe now this could just be happening to me but I feel like it's happening to everyone <laughs> so according to the Mayan prophecies in the way I interpreted them they knew about this time coming from a long time ago and as a as a a galaxy, only recently have scientists discovered that we are from a much smaller Sagittarius galaxy and we're colliding with the very large Milky Way. And as we come into its field, the proverbial shit is going to hit the fan, which is what we're experiencing now. Everything's getting stronger. Now, the, way, the reason I said a hot, expanding electric Earth is because I want to alert you to go online and do some research into an expanding Earth theory which basically says that in not too recent history the earth was 40% smaller and it's constantly expanding and there was no ocean. Now that may seem hard to believe but we've been sold the story of um, Pangaea, um, <laughs> sorry, of one giant planet, I mean one giant continent that split up and moved across the oceans but it's more likely to have been like a balloon with all the land mass joined and then as the planet expand more and more water is coming to earth now NASA has some pretty wild figures Every, anywhere from 250 to 50,000 tons of water arrive on this planet each day in the form of comets and small meteoritic, meteoritic dust and as they come into the atmosphere they form clouds and precipitation so there's an idea that there was a time on this planet where there was no water. And so each day more and more water arrives. But each day the planet also grows more massive. If you imagine one acre of forest, each day that acre of forest puts on it tons and tons of mass. If you spread that around the earth, there's a lot of mass being created on earth every day. And even if it was burnt in the fire, the residual ash has mass. And so what's happening is with the comets and meteoritic dust, the water, and the plants bringing mass to earth, 
the Earth is expanding, and we, when it reaches a certain size, when it reaches a certain mass and volume, it'll go through a quantum shift, just like any atomic weight. When you add certain atomic weight to um, an element, it jumps up in size to one atomic weight level higher and releases a photon of energy like an orgasm. I think we're very close to this point in history. <laughs> so, as we as we're approaching this time, <laughs> um, I'd I'd also um, encourage you to to have a look online at um, the Electric Universe, which basically says that our sun is not an electrical body. Our sun. I mean, sorry, it's not a thermonuclear explosion, explosion, it's an electrical body. It's a spinning dynamo, and it is drawing its energy from a source outside of itself. And it's in relation to the Earth, much like we are in a relationship to a lover walking across the room. Our lover doesn't necessarily heat us when we blush. We are blushing in proximity to that lover, not being heated by the lover. Now, this is very important, because if the sun was a thermonuclear device, and it was exploding, then surely there would be heat in space, but it's freezing cold. Surely the tops of mountain tops would be the hottest places, and the valleys, the lowest valleys on Earth, would be the coolest, and we find the opposite. So I feel like the heat comes from the Earth in response to the sun. We're in a dynamic relationship to the sun, and this is a really important aspect when we start to look at different realms of consciousness, because our relationship to the sun is instantaneous, just like the sun's relationship is instantaneous to the great central sun, which is where the minds were gathering their energy from about what is about to occur now. And what could be about to occur looks like a perfect storm brewing between the economy possibly crashing, between thermonuclear war between Iran and, I mean, between Iran and the United States, possibly China, between Pakistan and India, of course the global warming situation, it all seems like something's going horribly wrong. And what I'm going to propose to you is this is nothing but ourselves clearing, our, clearing energy from our bodies about ourselves that we have not come to terms with. In other words, this is a healing before the great purification. And anybody who is not at, at some stage doing work on themselves in relation to this and just moving into fear, I would say, is in for a big surprise. So, ready the ship. If we're standing on the ship and there's a big storm coming, there's no point in us shouting, global warming, look, let's try and stop the storm. What we've got to do is reef the sails and prepare for a storm. And a lot of us are already doing this. And the simple ways to prepare for the storm are prepare ourselves, our mental, emotional, and our physical bodies, our families, our communities. Building resilient communities is the single most potent way that we could go through massive change and have a huge buffer. And so I encourage everyone to expand on that and make sure they have within their community, a set up to supply their own energy if they want, to supply their own food, and to have people who are really together and who know how to heal themselves and each other. Right. So ready the ship. Okay, so this is all about relationship. Relationship is everything. Rela the relationship I have with me, the relationship I have with you, with my thoughts, with the television, with my computer, each one is an individual relationship and everything out here is mirroring what we, how we relate to ourselves. Um, the Dalai Lama, Dalai Lama once said, we're all searching for the same thing. And at the time, in that instant before he mentioned the answer, my mind raced to work out what it was. And he said, this is love and appreciation. We are all searching for love and appreciation, to be able to give and love, give and receive love and appreciation. And I'm going to start talking about addiction 
and why addiction rises. And of course, at this particular conference, I'm going to talk about the addiction of substance because, of course, there are many addictions. Okay, so the primary source that is love, and this is what we all seek. Now, when, we, when we're young, we seek, we seek this from our parents. And as we seek this from our parents, if we don't get enough, we do things to get attention. Now, that may be being naughty, that may be being clever, that may be doing a backflip, but we do whatever we do to get the love. And we develop a persona which thinks will get, give us the love. As we grow older, we start to interact with our peers, and there's a different set of rules what will give us, get us the attention or the love. And so we, we create another persona. We create one for our, our partners and spouses. We create one for our bosses. We create one for all the different social situations we're in. We create these different personas. And what they really are, are ideas of what we think we have to be in order to get that love. And sometimes it's being richer, sometimes it's being more beautiful, sometimes it's being more powerful. And the Tony Blairs and George Bushes of the world basically need some more love. And there's only one source for this love, and that is ourselves. Nobody can give us this love. And when we seek the love outside of ourselves, this is when we end up in habitual, addictive behavior. So there's a saying from the, the Talmud which says, we don't see the world the way it is, we see it the way we are. This is a mirror. Or another description would be like a dream. So all of you are characters in my dream. And it seems very real, but in actual fact, we're interfacing with our idea of what we think is. And this is very important. Now I'm going to tell you a quick story about the monkey pilot and the golden avatar. So the monkey pilot is this idea that there is an unbroken lineage of cellular biology that comes for billions of years that forms the super intelligent body. And when it gets to this stage, the monkey has an idea of self-realization and so I'm calling him the monkey pilot and he's a physical being that is having a spiritual experience. Now there's another being which is called the avatar and the avatar, the avatar is the immortal being some people call the spirit or the soul and the, the avatar is basically having a physical experience, he's a spiritual being having a physical experience. Now these two beings are sharing a reality which we call the body or the mind-body-spirit complex. And choosing which one we identify determines whether we can become habituated or addicted to something. Now the monkey pilot has needs, he has needs for food, shelter, security, water, air. The avatar has zero need. If the avatar stopped breathing, nothing would happen. If the body stopped breathing, the body would die, the avatar would continue. So the monkey has a different set of ideas of what it needs to stay alive. And I'm using the word need because need is of course the seed of all habitual behavior. And what the Buddha was talking about when he was talking about desire was need. He was talking about what we think we need. Now I'm going to briefly discuss a spectrum of emotions which modulates our needs. Um, many of us have had psychoactive experiences, maybe, on a, maybe pick something like mushrooms or LSD, and we may have experienced very high emotional states. And in these emotional states, we experience bliss. We experience a divine perfection. The bird sounds are just perfect. What everyone says is just so profound. And we're in a heavenly realm. And in that same journey, we may experience a hell realm. And that hell realm may mean that not only have we dropped out of bliss and we're not enjoying ourselves anymore, everyone starts to turn ugly or everything is poisonous and actually out to get us. Now that's a hell realm. Now the difference between bliss moving through joy into mild depression, deep depression to paranoia is one spectrum of emotional energy. When Buddhists talk about karma and being in a heavenly realm, it is about being able to trip or being able to experience a bliss realm. 
when we're in a hell realm, it is because of the seeds of karma or the things that we are doing that draw us into this idea that everything is acting against us. Now, the body is like a multi-track recording playback system. Each of the organs is like a recording head and a playback head. As the information, we are um, living in a bioelectromagnetic field. All of what we're experiencing now, moving through us, invisible and visible, is a bioelectromagnetic field from the light, from people's mobile phone receptions, radio receptions, TV, all the natural fields from the cosmos, gamma rays. We are bathed in this energy. Our blood happens to be, each blood cell is donut shaped, which for anyone who's interested in sacred geometry, this is the shape that can compress the, the maximum amount of data into physical form because it creates a toroid shape and a, a spiral that continually folds in, among, in on itself. So our blood happens to be this incredible shape, but it also happens to be have the center of it is made from iron. Now what that means is, as the blood is coursing through our body, it is recording this bioelectromagnetic signal. Now I'm going to cast your mind back to tape, and some of the younger people in the audience may not be familiar, but we used to have this thing called tape, which we'd record music on. And what that was, was a piece of cellophane with rust on it. And as the cellophane with the rust passes over the recording head, it changes the molecules of rust that sit on the cellophane and the, the music is recorded on the cellophane in the rust. Now our body is recording all of these signals all the time in our blood. And so each change and fluctuation in the signal is recorded. But the integrity of the signal we receive depends on a number of things. A, the shape of our aerial whether we're doing mudras or yoga, each time we move our body or if we're dancing in the field, we are driving a current of prana through the body. Um, old world cultures would put ochre on their arms and legs and heads to amplify the signal. Ochre is just basically rust. Um, the aboriginals would put um, emu feathers in certain patterns along the body and the emu feather has a high blood content and they would stick it on with ochre and this would act like an extra needle making them even more sensitive to the signals. Each thing we think and our emotions change the shape of our subtle bodies and determine what signals we receive. Okay. Now, I'm going to introduce um, what we call drugs. Now, what is a drug? For some people, a drug is a substance. But the way I see it, drug is not a substance. Drug is our relationship to a substance. We can become habituated or addicted to anything. And it's interesting how some of us find that we can take these so-called drugs and not feel like we need to take them. And others taking them and they feel like they need to take them. Now earlier on, Tim spoke of a psychoactive experience he had had of taking MDMA, MDMA. And what people tend to feel when they take MDMA is an incredible bliss. Now as most of us do not live in this bliss 24-7 as we may do if we were realizing our true natural state, this was kind of shocking. And we would go, wow, this feels incredible. Why do I feel so good? If we were in the right context and there was the right elder or someone around who could say, what you are feeling now is your natural state of being which you do not have access to because of the body armor that you have built up over your lifetime and through your belief systems, you do not have access to this bliss field. However, this is your true nature and this thing that you've just taken, this MDMA, MDMA is a catalyst allowing you to feel your true nature. Now, here are our techniques you can go to practice to get back there. 
then we would be able to explore our true nature, our blissful state, in another way. However, because we have not had this contextualized for us, what tends to happen is we experience the bliss state. It's very attractive because this is our natural state of being. And what we try and do is we try and get back there. The only way we know is take more drugs. But because we need the drug to get to the state, it then becomes a drug. It is not a drug when you first take it. It is a catalyst enabling you to see it's a window on your true nature. Then as you think that this thing exists outside of you, like a reflection or a shadow, you begin to chase it. The faster you chase it, the faster it moves. You find yourself going to parties, having to take two ecstasy, three ecstasy. It's not, the ease are not quite as good as they used to be. You know, how many times have you heard people talking about, lamenting about the days when ease were good? Okay, so this is what happens. <laughs> and maybe they were too, which just compounds the problem. <laughs> <laughs> so this is across the spectrum if, if, you, if you have a coffee in the morning and you get a buzz and it wakes you up and you become habituated and you feel like you can't actually get moving without a coffee you are now in a habitual relationship with this coffee you think you need the coffee to wake up and so this relationship becomes addictive now we, because we are all the avatar and the monkey pilot, we have a, a unique privilege. We can use all of the, the pharmacopoeia of drugs around us to teach us our true nature and our true states of being. Be it zero pain that we may experience through the opiates, be it zero body armor that we may experience through the social lubricant of alcohol, be it the power and that we feel of being a potent human on earth that we may feel through the stimulants or the expanded awareness of omniscience, omnipresence that we feel through the psychoactive substances. These are all us. As soon as we think they're not and they are outside of us in the form of a substance, we are moving towards an addiction. Now, of course, this occurs with people and thoughts and ideas, there's a lot that can be addictive. And what I'm going to basically run through you, through with you, are some tools to practice um, neural programming. Now, this has been going on for hundreds if not thousands of years. Um, for example, the Tibetan Buddhists are particularly good at structuring their neural pathways. Now, the neural pathways form along our ideas of thought and movement. And if you, you take a martial artist, um, I don't know if any of you remember Karate Kid, he goes, he's got to fight, fight some other kid, and he goes to the master to learn, and the master just teaches him to put wax on, wax on, wax off, wax on, wax off. And he's going, we're wasting time, and you're teaching me to polish. What, is, what the master's teaching him is to do a process again and again and again ad nauseum because what that process is doing is it's building up the neural pathways. And when the neural pathways are a specific strength, in other words, your old ways have gone and the new ways are there, then when someone tries to punch you, you do that because if you had to stop and think, oh, this guy's about to punch me, it's too late. This has to be second nature. So the art of neural programming is if you take a psychoactive and you realize the truth, this is just the beginning. Realizing it is the first stage. You then have to practice so that your second nature, so that your unconscious dissolves and so that this way of walking and talking becomes your true nature, your first nature, because otherwise as soon as you move into those paranoid states, as soon as our emotional energy drops, bang, we're onto this, the same old neural pathways. Okay, so psychoactive substances gives you the fantastic metaprogramming keys to reprogram your neural pathways. And the way to reprogram them is by repetition and practice. And I know it doesn't sound good, but that's kind of what you've got to do. So, technology is all converging. 
we have mobile phones, we have cars, we have watches, we have computers. Each of these technologies is mirroring to us how we are grappling with the idea of having discovered the most advanced piece of technology that ever exists in this realm. And that is the human body. Of course it's the earth too because the human body does not end here, it continues. But what I'm suggesting to you is when you find the instruction manual, you will be able to bilocate, you will be able to do telepathy, you will be able to do all of the so-called city powers. These are our true nature and we have forgotten the instruction manual and there's a specific reason for that which I may or may not have time to get, in, get into right now. But through the psychoactive substances we can find that help menu again and I'm going to suggest certain ways to do that. So I've, I've covered what a drug is and what it does to us and that it's uh, not a substance but a habituated relationship to something. Initiation and the blissful jewel within is obviously our true nature and I'm going to reveal to you a simple solution to all problems. <laughs> now the, these problem, the, this covers personal problems, social problems, political problems, global warming problems, galactic problems. This is problems across the board. There's a simple practice and this is cultivate self-love. Now for those of you that this may sound too simplistic, the self expands continually. For some people they think it's a small being. But what happens is as you cultivate self-love you see the being expands. It expands to your close community, your friends, it expands to nature, it expands to the earth, it expands to the whole cosmos. And very soon we realize this. We realize that the self is ever evolving but never changing. That the self is everything and nothing at the same time. There is no path that does not lead to the divine. There is no right or wrong path. Whichever path you are on is the path. So we realize that you are God and so is everyone and everything else all at the same time. Woo! 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 Now through this process you can realize that life is happening for you and not to you. Now there's a big distinction here because if you believe that life is happening to you, you're a victim. You could be a victim to your genetics and your DNA, thinking you were born in a particular way and there's nothing you can do about it. Now, recent biological evidence suggests that we can change even our DNA. Our DNA is just a blueprint and if you'd like to research more, there's someone called Bruce Lipton who's written some incredible books, one of which is called The Biology of Belief and it's all backed up scientifically and it's an amazing idea but I'd like you to invest time and energy realizing that each moment is divinely orchestrated to be our optimum and most potent moment for self-realization no matter what is happening whether it's you sitting here whether it's you having a car smash or making love whatever is happening at that moment has already been divinely coordinated for all the different units to be their optimum moment for self-realization So here are some tools. Don't take it personally. Don't take it seriously. Maybe you can tattoo one on each underneath of your eyelid. <laughs> Don't worry. Be happy. Sounds simple. But by the mere changing of your emotional energy, you are shifting from hell into heaven. And it's by us realizing that point and radiating that energy gives everyone else permission to do the same. One of the most potent tools for this is gratitude because if you are feeling gratitude for whatever is happening, you cannot experience fear at the same time. This is something that came up earlier. Resistance is persistence. Now this is counterintuitive and counterlogical. What you'd expect is if there's something you don't like, 
you make steps towards and you change it. And we've been taught that this is possible. But in fact, if we are emotionally attached to an outcome, the opposite is, is what actually occurs. How many of us have maybe had a relationship um, at an early part of our lives and we thought, oh, I like that person, except for that, 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 and that. And don't worry, in time I'll change it. And of course, it never changes. In fact, those things tend to get stronger. So when we have a war on drugs, and a war on poverty, and a war on terrorism, you can be sure that there will be more of these in the world. Because what we resist persists. And the only way around this is if we are not attached to an outcome. That way we can dream a world that we would like, but if we're not particularly bothered whether it happens or doesn't happen, then we are putting our energy to dreaming and creating it the way we would like. As soon as we invest our energy in the subtlety of it has to happen or we need it to happen or we're addicted to the idea that this will happen, what we're actually doing is moving further and further away from that dream. Another tool is pretend realisation. Pretend realisation is, is a trick. If you're sitting in a particular place and something happens, you just elevate an idea and say, what would I do in this situation if I were a self-realised being? And practice that. Kids do it all the time. So the final frontier becomes the mind. And when I talk about the mind, I'm not talking about what's trapped in our cranium. I'm talking about an all-expansive, pervasive field, a field that we think we're walking in. This is our mind. Now, this is not different from a dream. In a dream, if you're being chased by a wild dog, vicious dog, wants to bite your ass, you run. That is because you do not perceive that that dream, you perceive that that dream is real. Now there's a, a very potent practice of lucid dreaming that when we wake up in that dream, it means we can do whatever we like. We have the sovereignty and the power. And what I'm going to suggest to you is that this reality is not really different from a dream. So bringing back the treasure and the essence of I was quite well covered in that Terence McKenna quote and it's basically um, Native American saying is, does it grow corn? Does it have a physical application here on earth? Does it enrich your life here and now? If not, it's entertainment. And so um, you can look at Joseph Campbell. He had a fantastic way in which he expressed this about traveling to other dimensions, knowing what it is you're looking for being able to be conscious enough to see it, being able to remember it, remembering this thing is beyond words, bringing it back to this realm and being able to sing it, dance it, paint it, draw it, dream it, because this is the cutting end envelope. This is how we bring heaven to earth. This is how we dream. So, to all psychonauts and fellow travelers, have fun. <laughs> Okay, I'm not really finished yet. Um, I'm going to share with you a, um, a short uh, experience that I had when I went to the dentist. Five more minutes and then question time. All right? Yep. A uh, short experience. So I went to the dentist and the dentist started uh, a, a procedure on my mouth. It was really painful. I said, please, can you put on the gas? Put on the gas, I said, it's still painful, turn it up, turn it up. He hit the max, and I tell you, it was kind of interesting. Um, he was no longer operating on me. I was the dentist, I was the nurse, I was everything. And from previous hippie crack or nitrous oxide experiences, there's very little recall. You, you get it. You know it, but it's very difficult to bring back into this reality. And what actually occurred to me was I was taken to a different realm and I was shown a secret. And I think the secret you all know, but I'm going to share it with you. 
Now this happens across the whole sense, sense level. When you are looking at something that you think is beautiful, let's say it's a flower, let's say it's a lotus flower, out of your eyes flows an energy which that flower can absorb. And that flower gleans its beauty. Even though it has a self-existing beauty, it can absorb the energy from you which makes it more beautiful and there's a feedback loop. And you, you're, you recognizing its beauty and its color and shape heals your body or recognizes your healing, flowing, living energy in your body. And so each thing we see that is beautiful is healing us. Now, each thing that we see, hear, look at, touch, that we feel is ugly, it can be a war, it can be someone abusing someone else. What, is, what we are experiencing here is also us. These are the aspects of ourselves which we have not come to accept yet that need healing and if we do not heal they will move from seemingly out here closer and closer and have become physical ailments within the body. So look at all the things that you don't like, look at all the things that you hate because those are the keys that if you don't, do not address they will eventually become disease in your body. So follow the beauty, more beauty in your life, more healing. Okay. Now I've got one more minute and I'm going to share with you um, a couple of things. One is uh, the ay ayahuasca and the future of culture and dreaming, singing, dancing and loving. I've been involved with ayahuasca for many lives, including this one. It's a very potent healing plant for me. It may not be for everyone. But I noticed there's more and more people in our community, this community and the community where I live in Byron Bay, becoming more and more interested in ayahuasca. I'll be talking on a forum, um, but I'm not sure what I'm going to be able to express then. But what I've seen so far is that the energy of ayahuasca has entered the Australian Eastern Seaboard at this time and it may be just in the sound signature of toads and people growing ayahuasca, but the ayahuasca that I've drunk, made from vines grown in Australia, is unique. It is special. It is powerful. It has different energy with, that it's absorbed from the land. And I think we're all in for an incredible ride for the ayahuasca community. And what I'd like to do is, with anyone interested, formulate a plan on how to unfold this in a cultural context how we can unfold it into art. Like I said, they're dreaming, singing, dancing, loving. It needs to have a contextual base because through that contextual creative base, it legitimizes, it becomes part of the dream and then it's no longer a drug. This is a cultural context. So undoubtedly the universe is unfolding as it should and I'm going to end with a a quote from the Chogyam Upanishad, in fact I'm going to paraphrase, and it says the sun and the moon, the stars, the whole galaxy, mountains, oceans, lakes and land all exist in a lotus-shaped temple in your heart. Thank you. <laughs>